He didn't have to do any of that. But see, he, he, he allowed the problem to occur, and he gave you a way out of it. So there's no reason not to accept it. Take your Bibles, go to John. We've, uh, we've had some, some sad things happen to our church in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And I thought I'd just take some time this morning to go through some things. John chapter 13, verse 5. It talks about the, the washing of the feet. You know the story. Anybody who's been around knows this. It says, after uh, that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them uh, with a towel uh, wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon uh, Peter, and, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, "What I do, uh, do thou know? Uh, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter." Peter said unto him, "Thou shalt uh, never wash my feet." Jesus answered him, "If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me." Simon Peter said unto him, "Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head." Jesus said, uh, saith to him, "He that is washed needeth not uh, save to wash his feet, but is uh, every whit clean." And ye are clean, but not all. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. I do pray that you'd bless this message. It's a simple message, Lord, not complicated. Uh, Lord, as some things just happened in our church for the last couple, two or three weeks. And uh, Lord, uh, just uh, our church needs some comforting this morning. Lord, needs some, uh, just some love from you. And Lord, uh, thank you for what you did for us. Uh, Lord, make it a way that we could come back to heaven, that we could get there, Lord. Uh, a way that could never have been uh, purchased any other way than the way you did it at Calvary. And Lord, I just want to thank you for that. So bless this message this morning. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this week, Friday morning at, at, uh, on, on the 17th at 1030, 18, uh, 1030 a.m., Miss Betty McKay went home to be with the Lord. If you didn't know that, uh, it was, it was some, just some things that uh, needed to be done before it was made known to everybody. But she was 101 years old. Uh, she's getting up in age, her eyes were starting to fail her, and, and she, she was just ready to go home. She told me a bunch of times, she goes, I don't know why I'm still here, I don't know why I'm still here. Well, you're still here because God has a reason for you to be here. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the bottom line of the thing. Uh, I always told her, I don't want to be 101. I said, I'm sorry, she has convinced me totally that I do not want to be 101. <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, she was in very good health. I mean, she could still get around. And, uh, my mom's 91, and, and she's broke both hips in, in, in a nursing home down there, and she can't hardly get around. Uh, but it's, it's a sad thing that that's happened. Then, then uh, yesterday we went to a funeral. Uh, uh, Boomer Ellison, 51 years old, passed away uh, as brother, Bowman's, brother and sister Bowman's brother-in-law. And he passed away suddenly, just a heart attack. And, and so that you got, you got a, a loss of a loved one over here and a loss of a loved one over here. And then uh, Yvonne Pritchard, Brother Mike, and, and uh, Miss Ruth was keeping Yvonne for a while. And, and a lot of people know Yvonne. She's been around for a long, long time in, in church and different churches here and there. But she was, she's part of us. And she passed away. And then uh, uh, Richard Donovan, 77, passed away. Uh, brother Mike Bennett's uh, his brother-in-law, right? Half-brother. Half brother passed away. The blessing of all these is all of them were saved. Amen. It's easy to talk about them because they were all saved. Every one of them was going to heaven. Psalm, Psalm 90 verse 9 says, For all our days are passed away in wrath. This is a, a psalm of Moses. Moses wrote this. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Our life, our life starts and ends. I heard a man preach one time and he said, You go to a graveyard and I've been to thousands of them and and every tombstone's the same, and has a date and another date and a dash in between, and your life is the dash. What is your dash? See, so many times we, this life just kind of goes so fast. I'm, I'm 66 a, a couple days ago, on the 12th I turned 66, and I just can't believe how fast this thing has gone. I mean, I remember sitting on the back porch talking to the Lord when I got saved. <laughs> I just remember that. It seems like it was yesterday. It doesn't, time has just gone so fast, I don't have any time to think about other things. I don't have time to go out. There's, there's too much stuff in this world that can be done. I don't want to do none of that. I want to just make it through this thing and get to glory and be there. And, and uh, we had to go over and, and tell Miss Louise that, uh, that Betty had passed away, Miss McKay passed. And, and when we got there, we told her, and, and she pointed across the room, and on her, in her a room, here's Miss, I mean, she's 90, no, 93. And she had over there a little uh, thing on the floor, a little plaque, and it says, maybe today. 
You know what she's waiting for? The same thing we're all waiting for, the Lord to come back and take us out of here. Amen. And she, she started crying, and she goes, oh, I thought I would go before Betty. <laughs> well, I'd be mad too, man. She left us here, and now we got to deal with the rest of this stuff. But it says, it says, um, Psalm 90, it goes, the days of our years, back to uh, uh, Psalm 90, verse 10, says, the days of our years are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score, Yet uh, is, is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It doesn't matter if you got 70 or 80 or 20 or 30. In any, any case, it's like a vapor. James says it's like a vapor. It goes away. Paul's thought was this, though. Paul said, uh, Philippians 1.21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labors. Yet what, shall, what I... I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, which it is. <laughs> Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul learned to take the, the high road and not be selfish. And sometimes life comes and we lose people, and here's four deaths in our church in the last couple, two or three weeks. And, and there's, you can feel it. It's all over the church where there's sadness and sorrow, which there should be, and and we have some people that's went on, but all four of these aren't having any problems at all right now. Uh, Miss Betty don't have a problem with her eyes anymore. Uh, she definitely don't have no problem with a walker anymore. That thing was left here. Guess what? When she left out of here, her body stayed and she disappeared and, and she probably got a new one and she's cruising around having a great time. Uh, Boomer Ellison is not having a part. I doubt if he's racing. I don't think he's racing in heaven, but he's there. And he's, he's probably cruising just like everybody else. He can't believe what he sees. You couldn't imagine, you couldn't even begin. He said, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered the hearts of men the thing that God had prepared for them that love him. It's not what's down here, brother. It's not what's down here. It's what's out there. What's out there is something that's so grand and so great, so magnific magnificent that you couldn't even imagine it if you tried. He says, you just got to get here to see it. And you know what you do down here dictates what it is up there to you. And I, I just soon say, hey, man, I want to say... Uh, Yvonne Pritchard passed away. She was 65. Now, Betty was 101. <coughs> it was time for her to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm, I, I, I don't want to make it sound. But someplace in life, it's the point of a man wants to die. You got to go. Uh, you can't stay here. I mean, some people think they can stay here and they're up in the sky and their feet's flying. No, you can't stay here forever. You're just a passing through. You're, you're headed out of this place. You're not, you're not here eternally. So you know what you got to do? You got to prepare for the next one. I knew in the Navy, I, I love the Navy. I, I, if you didn't know I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy. Everybody always say, are you going to say anything about the Navy? I try not to anymore. But, but I knew when I checked into a command, I had three years and I was going to check out. I already knew that. Uh, my tour was three years unless something really drastic happened that they needed to keep me for some length of time. Uh, or I did something bad to get kicked out of the Navy. It was going to be three years to the date. I knew the day I checked in, I could tell you the day I was going to leave that ship three years from now, or the command. That's this life. You know, you don't know the day you're going to, it's a point when a man wants to die. You have no idea what that day's going to be. Here's one that was, uh, Boomer, Boomer was 51. That's the youngest of the bunch. Yvonne was 65, Richard was 77, and, and Betty was 101. Paul, Paul says, it's better to say, but these, these people have gone on. The verse I'd like to talk about just for a minute today is back up in John 13, 7. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You know, sometimes you cannot figure what God's doing. You just can't. There's no way you can do it. Uh, that's why he gives you verses like, Sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. You live it one day at a life at a time. You go through the thing, and you trust God, and you never know it. Uh, there's men and women all through our Bible that God gave us story after story after story to help you understand what life is about. And when you examine their lives and you look at their lives the way uh, the Bible lays it out, what you get is a story all the way through, and God will show you what your life is, it should be like. Uh, it won't be exactly like theirs, and it won't match theirs, but, but what you find out is those men and women had to slow their lives down and start serving God and living with him day by day. Because it's, you don't know what the, tomorrow will bring. You have no idea what tomorrow has. All you have is the moment that you're living in, and that's it. You never know. Uh, nobody ever thinks that they're going to walk down the road and the car is going to hit them. You hear it all the time on the expressways where men are out there working or whatever, and, and they're working, they go to work tonight, and the car hits them, and, and the next thing you know, they're gone. 
you hear about car wrecks or whatever you hear about of people dying and passing on. Uh, over in, in uh, Israel, they never thought that day that, that, they, that the, the Palestinians was going to fly in and 1,400 people was just going to die. They never thought that. They just never thought that. But they had to get, you need to always be ready for that stuff. But when it happens, those people are already gone. But what we have to do is we have to figure out that, hey, God is still in this thing. And he will always be in it. And until he takes me out of there, he is in my life. And if I want him in my life, I need to inject him into my life and me into his. And then I need to learn some things. I'd like to talk, first of all, uh, what I do, thou knowest not now. Now, Jesus is washing their feet. Peter doesn't understand that. Uh, but there's so much other stuff. When you take that verse and pull that thing out of the scriptures, just right there, and I'm not pulling it out of context. In context, he's saying, I'm washing your feet now. You don't understand why I'm washing your feet. You'll get it later. You know how much stuff God does in our lives that we don't get till later? If we ever get it at all? I mean, God just continues. This is one story right here. He's telling Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. Peter said, no, you're not. Well, then if I don't, you don't have no part of me. Okay, my feet, my hands, my head, everything. I, I just got to wash your feet. He's just talking about feet here. But in that passage of Scripture, he says, what I do now. You know, when somebody passes away, we don't understand that. And you may, may or may not ever understand that. Again, you may. The Lord's let me see some things in my life that he's run me through, and later on down the road, I got to see some things. But in the process of that, he's always told me at those places. He says, Mike, I'm only showing you this. He goes, most people never get to see this. I told you all about that time when I was on the Scott and I left the ship. I got mad and got out of the Navy because nobody got saved on that ship. And I preached to everything that moved. I gave my heart on that ship and nobody got saved. I was like, if this is the way you treat me, I'm out of here, man. And I went down the brow of that ship. I was so mad I could spit. I probably did all the way down. And old Mr. Louie, man. I wish I, could, I, I wish I could meet Mr. Louie again. A little Italian guy about this tall. He's about that tall, really. It's a midget. <laughs> he was just leaning, leaning on, the, on the handrail. And I'm going down just as mad as I can be. And he's laughing. He's already set me up. He says, hey, Elliot. I said, what? He's a lieutenant. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a civilian. <laughs> I don't care no more. He goes, when you come back in, come see me. I'll reenlist you. I said, I ain't coming back in this man's Navy ever. Six months later, I was back in the Navy. <laughs> you never know what the future holds for you. He had already called Senior Chief Franklin, got me a job. I was overhauling ships. I learned real quick after about three months that if you're in the Navy, if you're in Norfolk, Virginia, you need to be in the Navy or get out of Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia is not a place for anybody that's not in the Navy. I could not, for it wasn't for me anyways. And I go back in the Navy, but you know what happened in that six months? I'm sitting in church one day. This is how important your testimony is. You have to learn this over a period of time, but this is how important your testimony is. I'm in a house church. Ron Burrs has got a house church. It's a house, man. It's his home. He has church in his living room. Every Sunday morning, he sets his church up. There's only about 10 of us there. And I'm sitting there one Sunday morning, and a, a red 72 Chevelle pulls up with a black model top. I still see the car. It's Scott Flood's car. I know exactly whose car that is. That's one of the guys on the ship. He says, Scott, that I had been witnessing to for three years and never got saved. Scott comes in, he sits down, Brother Burris gets up there and preaches. After he gets done, I walk Scott up there, introduce him to Brother Burris, and I leave and go out and start praying. I come back about 45 minutes later, Scott saved. I said, Scott, what happened to you, man? He said, I got saved, Mike. I said, why didn't you get saved while I was on the ship? He goes, because you never asked me. I'm like, what? He goes, you never asked. So I didn't get saved. He goes, every time I had a problem, I'd come find you on a ship, and you'd tell me what I needed to hear. And he goes, then, after you told me what I needed to hear, I got peace in my heart, and I could walk away. He goes, well, one day you left, and when you left, there was nobody to get that from anymore, and I had to go find what, you know what Scott was doing? He knew exactly where I was going to be on Sunday morning. You know how many times that kid went up and down the street where that house was before he ever came in? He knew right where I was going to be on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That kid knew the address. This was a house in a subdivision. He knew right where I was going to be. Then he came in, got saved. 13 or 14 other guys got saved right after that, just like that. Same thing. I'm like, boy, am I an idiot. I said, Lord, you're going to make me go back to the Navy. He said, now, why did you say all that? Because that verse right there says, what I do now, thou knowest not. He goes, Mike, he said, I'm showing you something that most people will never see in their entire life. You go out on a ship and you do some stuff. 
And you didn't know what you were doing, but you were doing the best you could. And he said, you told everybody, and you did the best you could. And you told them about me, but you forgot one little part at the end. You forgot to set the hook. He goes, you got, if you go fishing, man, you got to pull the net in, or you got to pull the fishing rod, rod in and pull the hook and get the hook stuck in your mouth. He said, you didn't do that. He said, you learned your lesson? I said, yeah. You know what he did? He taught me something. He goes, all that stuff for three years, what you were doing, he said, I didn't tell you what you were doing. He goes, and if I hadn't have told you this, you would have known that. He goes, you know what you do? You just keep doing what I told you to do. And you don't ever know. You just do it day after day after day. Whether you know what's going on or not, you just do it. You just do the right thing. I did the right thing. Moses, but not Elijah. Elijah shows up on the scene, and the first time you see him, uh, he's, he stops the rain. You know, if the Lord had stopped with Elijah right there and took him out here, how much other stuff would have never occurred? The Lord could have said, okay, I'm going to use Elijah one time, but he didn't. But he never told Elijah that you're going to go to this lady until after he needed to go to that lady, and there was going to be a barrel of a mill and a, a cruise of oil that never would go dry and never would run out of mill. But he never told him that. He goes, what do I do now? I want you to go tell about the rain and stop the rain. But I'm not going to tell you the other stuff after this. We got four people that have passed on, and, and they're in glory today. You know what we got to do? Keep on going. And he may or may not ever give you a reason why these four left. Miss Betty, I kind of understand why she left. I mean, as somewhere in the near future of that day that if she hadn't gone in, somewhere down the road, it will be there. But somebody who's 50, 51 years old, Boomer, you would have never thought he would have been gone at that early age. My uncle left at 51. My dad was 67. I think I had another uncle that was like 57 or something like that. I had one that lasted until like 81 or 82 uh, but it just happens. I mean, things happen. I had a nephew that died at 13. It just, things just happen. He stopped the rain. Then he went on, and uh, he got the everlasting oil in the barrel of mill. He went on, and the, that widow's son died. And once, once the widow's son died, he brought him back to life. He had the great victory on Carmel. We all know about that one. He killed 850 men up there. Uh, and got, uh, and Jezebel got all mad at him, and he took off running. He brought back the rain. Then he ended up under a juniper tree asking to die. And that's pretty much, I'm going to leave him there for a second. Moses, Moses was raised 40 years. He's sitting under there and Elijah did not understand what God had planned for him. But God's under no obligation to tell you what he's got planned for you. You know what he tells you to do is serve him day by day. And in the process of all that, he'll work it out and show you what he has for you. But you got to work with him day by day, by day by day. You know, Elijah just lays there. Then Moses comes in. Moses is sitting there. Forty years he's raised. He could have died. Uh, uh, Pharaoh said, kill all the young baby male, male kids, throw them in the, in the river now. And, and uh, his mom's a smart lady, so she tells, uh, makes a bull rush and, and, and coats it with pitch and everything. So water can't get in. And she goes, sets it right up there, has her daughter set it right up there where the Pharaoh's daughters go swimming, knowing that Pharaoh's daughter is going to see it. She probably already knew that she had a tender heart. And she's going to see that little baby there. She sticks Moses right under her nose. And she already knows that, hey, this lady's going to have a tender heart. And she's going to see this little baby crying. And she's just not going to have the heart to poke a hole in the bottom of that thing and sink it where the gators can eat it. She's going to take that kid. And she does. And then she tells Miriam, hey, by the way, when she does this, you go up and say, hey, I know this lady that can nurse that baby. How about that? And then she pays her to nurse the baby until it gets to a certain age and she raises it her own. Moses was raised in the palace with Pharaoh and he was raised as Pharaoh's son. Forty years later, 40 years goes by pretty quick in your Bible. Forty years later, Moses does what he does, kills an Egyptian, runs out in the desert. Backs out of the desert for 40 years just hangs out there then he goes up on a mountainside and he and he does all this stuff and he sees the burning bush and he talks to the burning bush and and the burning bush tells him to go do something and, and he goes does what the bush tells him to do man you think we'd we'd hear it man you got a bible sitting in front of you but i'm telling you man we'll talk to you just as well as that burning bush ever would that book right there has this thing that was a, a few moments of a conversation that moses had with a bush I've had a, a conversation with this book for 43 years. I'm telling you, this goes on and on and on. And you know what the Lord still does? He still shows you some things out of the book, but he's not obligated. What I do, thou knowest not now. He said, Mike, I'm not going to tell you everything now. He said, I never told Moses everything. Why would I tell you? 
He said, where is faith if I tell you everything? If I tell you how to get up in the morning and how to do this and how to do that and tell you how to do that for 40, 50, 60 years, what is that, man? Where's the adventure in that? I said, no, Lord, I like it the way it is, man. I get up every day and it's just something new. It's the craziest thing in the whole world. This thing gets so crazy. I mean, really, if you start trying to do what God has you to do, it gets narrowed down to so much that if you take care of what is in front of you, you don't have time to do much of anything else. We got an apartment over there that we're trying to get going. We got the second apartments coming on. Ben and Faith's moving in hopefully Monday. And I'm sitting there going, I said, Lord, we still got two or three more to fix up and get them out of the way. And then we're done with that thing. The Lord says, no, you won't be done with that, but I'm not going to show you nothing now. I'm going to wait till you get that done because if you don't get that done, why do you even care about what? The only reason we got those apartments is there's a bathroom right behind the baptismal that was not done. And the nursery was a pigsty. And I was sitting there, and the Lord says, you got a bathroom and a pig sky nursery you got to take care of. I said, okay. So we did it. Me and Mike went in there one day in the toilet, a little hole like this where the toilet sits. And the toilet was all sitting in the center. I said, I don't like that. Mike said, that's okay. I said, but I don't like that. I said, Mike, Mike, we got to move that toilet. Mike's shaking his head like this. Mike comes in with, I'm telling you, he comes in with a little thing, a spatula mud and a spatula. He's got this spatula that is round. I mean, it's a one-inch spatula. It's round on both ends. Uh, and somewhere down the road, he told Brian that he actually ground that off. But he goes, no, I wore that thing down. He does everything with those two things. If he walks into a building that's fallen down, he will put it back together with that. <laughs> if he can't put it back together with that, he don't come in. So when I told him that, he, I said, we got to take a jackhammer in here. We got to jackhammer this concrete floor up. And we got to move that toilet flange over here. Mike, I said, and you're the plumber, so you're going to have to do all this. I'll jackhammer it up. And we moved it over, got everything set, got that thing done, got the nursery done. And that piece of property dropped right into our hands. You say, well, what is that? The Lord says, now what are you going to do with the buildings? I'm like, yeah. yeah. I thought I was done. He goes, no, you're not done yet. But I didn't tell you about all that. So we get the buildings and go over and start looking at them like, this is messed up. Bugs everywhere. We had to call them. They had a month worth of exterminating before we could even start working on the stupid things. Then another month of hauling everything off. And then once they tore out all the, the blacktop, we had to replace everything. You say, what is that? Keeping you busy? Getting you right where God wants you to be. Right down the middle. You say, well, what is that? God knows. I don't. You know what I know? He stuck it in our face and he says, do it. You know what you do? You just do it. And you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and doing it. And one day, you're done with the thing. And guess what? He'll give you something else to do after that. Moses is sitting on the backside of the desert taking care of some sheep for 40 years. 40 years. God's not obligated to tell him anything in those 40 years. He says, just sit here, Moses. you got to get some stuff burned off. Moses does. He's faithful for 40 years. Then he gets in the service of God for the next 40 years. He sits there and he goes down with a stick and tells Moses, tells uh, Pharaoh all this stuff. And next thing you know, they're in the promised land. Or they're headed to the promised land after 40 years of being in the wilderness out there and everybody dying off. Then he tells him, he said, you're going to go up to a mountain, you're going to die. Moses says, can I just go into the promised land? You know what the Lord told him up on top of that before he got up here? He said, Deuteronomy 3.26, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. Hey, don't think I'm always just mad at you. God gets mad at me a lot of times because of you guys. It works that way, man. Don't you understand that? God expects a, a pastor to be the pastor of the church, and if sometimes you do the wrong thing, he smacks you in the middle of the next week to get you back on track. Why? Because it's for you guys. You know what you need? You need somebody to help you get to the place. You know what you all should do? One of these days, I like over in Timothy, it says, if you desire the office of a bishop, you desire a good thing then a bishop must be blamed. You know what you're supposed to be is blameless. Have you ever tried to be blameless? That's one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life. There's nothing wrong with striving or wanting to be that, but what if God doesn't want you to be that? In this church, you know how many pastors you need? One. And one day this one's going to go away and you'll need the other one. And then when that one goes away, you'll need another one if the Lord tarries. Praise God. Hope he done. I'm like Miss, Miss uh, Louise. I want that little sign. I'm going to get one. Maybe today. That's what we ought to get. Maybe today. You never know when today. Maybe before this sermon's over. Forty years he's out there. And the Lord said, Lord, and the Lord said unto me because he's wroth, let it suffice thee, speak no more of this matter to me. Speak no more of this matter to me. Or he said, no more unto me of this matter. Speak no more. 
I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it out of your mouth one more time, Moses. You're going to go up on the side of the mountain. You're going to die. Why? What I do, thou knowest not now. And I don't have to tell you. And I'm not going to tell you. You know, sometimes, brethren, things happen in our lives. And these four people that have passed away affect different people in the church different ways. It affects a lot of other people. Uh, Miss Betty has been around for a long, long time. Miss Betty, if it wasn't for her, this church may or may not be here today. Beth was cutting hair. If it wasn't for my wife cutting hair, uh, Miss Betty wouldn't have been in my driveway. You see how God does some weird things? If it hadn't been me meeting her in Miss Sue's house, uh, this church would not be here. There is so many things God has to do. I didn't know none of that. I was sitting there come home one day, and I cut down the front tree of my house, and it falls on my new house and busts my gutters. And then I got to go cut the, the tree all up, and, and I can't. Miss Betty and Miss Bonnie comes over, Betty's sister, to get their hair cut. And they can't get in the house because there's a tree in the way. And I'm out there with a chainsaw. And Beth is in the driveway cutting hair like a good wife does. Remember that? She's out there cutting hair. And Miss Betty looks at me and says, hey, when are you going to start a church? I'm like, that's stupid. I said, you know how many churches? What's that? Two weeks, yeah. I said, that's stupid. She goes, no, it's not. I said, yes, it is. And then I, I look at the, my garage. And if you see my garage, if you know anything about me, go look at my truck. My truck is clean compared to what my garage looked like. My garage is clean right now compared to what it used to look like. You would open the door and take your life in your hand. I mean, anything could fall out of that garage from any angle and get you and kill you. My father-in-law used to laugh at me because I would dive in that thing and crawl over the top of everything and reach way down in there and grab this little screwdriver thing or whatever. And he goes, how did you? I said, that's where I left it. He goes, how could you possibly know that in there? So I just did, man. I mean, that's where I left. That's how my mind works. I'm working up here, I just drop my tools. I walk away. People say, why do you do that? I know where they're at when I come back. Right there they are, man. You start moving them around, I'll come in here and work with, oh, man, uh, uh, Brian. Brother Brian is like a clean maniac. And he'll, I mean, he hides everything on you, man. You can't find it. But that's okay. We've, we've learned some things. He's trying to teach me how to be clean. But, but you know what? You sit there and you go through all of this stuff and you... You start, the Lord says, do this. And Miss Betty said, build it. And I looked back at my garage. I said, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll clean it. She said, you can't do it. I said, then that's a challenge. Now the challenge comes in. And, and I back my trailer up to that garage and I start dumping. And I start dumping. And I start dumping. I just dump. If I haven't touched it, I dump. It's going away. We're going to start a, a church in my garage. Why? Because the Lord won't get off my back. That wasn't the first time he said that, but he wouldn't get off my back. He said, we're going to start a church in the garage, and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to start a church, I'm going to run everybody off, and then I'm going to go back sitting on the couch watching TV. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to drywall that garage, I'm going to insulate that garage, I'm going to air condition that garage. I got two lights hanging off. It's still there today, man. You come over and look at them. They're stained glass lights. I couldn't put windows in stained glass, so I put them in Catholic. Get the Catholic in you, man. I mean, what do you do? It's, got, it's back there. And they're right there still in my garage with fans on them. And uh, so we did that, and, and we started the church. I said, I want five things. And it all started with Miss Betty and Beth and Miss Bonnie and, and a few others before that. And, but every one of them had an integral part in us doing that. Now, Miss Betty's a sweet lady. So when we moved out of the house to this church, she came in and she seen the bathroom left. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second, you stay in the garage, and we get a building, and, and after we got the bathrooms all done, they came back, which I don't blame. Ladies are strange. When it comes to bathrooms, ladies are strange. But, but you sit there and look at all that stuff, and I didn't have no idea. That what, it's like, what I do now, thou knowest not. God didn't show me all the stuff that was out in the future. You lose somebody sometimes, and you don't have an understanding, and no matter what happens in life, you have to stop and say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. All you have to do is live life. And guess what? You're, you're going to go where they're. I like David says, that little boy that died, his son died. He said, I will not go to him. He will not come to me, but I will go to him. You know what David knew? That little boy was in heaven with the Lord. And he goes, one of these days, I'm going to be in heaven with the Lord, and I'll go where that boy is. But I'm going to get off the ground. His, his, his servants got really upset. They couldn't. Well, not upset. They got confused. They said, look, man, they said, you laid on the ground. Was, man, the baby's dead. What are we going to do? We're going to tell him. We tell him, man. He's going to get off. The baby's looking up. He's looking up. And then he gets up off the ground, dusts him off. He says, hey, where's the chow at, man? Go get me some Chick-fil-A or something. And uh, they said, well, wait a minute. 
you laid on the ground for seven days, man. You wouldn't eat or drink or nothing. And now all of a sudden, you, you, he goes, while the baby was alive, there's chance. But when that baby's dead, it's gone. And the Lord's made his decision, and i got to get back up and keep going. You know what we got to do? you got to keep up and keep going. You can't ever stop. There's no stopping. There's no stopping place. This thing, you never have time. You ever find out where God wants you to be and you get into it? You don't have time to stop. I look at Dr. Peacock, and he moves week after week after week after week. He's, he's preaching somewhere else. I couldn't do that if I wanted. He looks at me and says, brother, I couldn't do what you're doing. And as, as soon as we get, Mike, we're already, Mike's about ready to quit, man. He came, I think he hit his hand with a hammer the other day. I don't think anything happened. I think he did something to hurt himself so he could quit. <laughs> I mean, you sit there and look at, oh, I mean, we are wearing ourselves out. You know what? That's God throwing stuff in your path. And he says, do it, do it, do it. You know what it does? It keeps you out of trouble. He doesn't tell us what the future holds. I don't know. Samson, Samson killed a lion. Moses, I'll tell you, Moses stopped up on top of that mountain, and he, he, he died right there, and they buried him, not knowing what the future is. Samson killed a lion. Anytime down through your lot, the Lord could have stopped with him. Killed 30 Philistines. Burning, burn, burnt a field with a bunch of foxes. I mean, he, you're talking about a guy who did nothing but cause trouble. He killed over a thousand Philistines, carried the gate of Gaza. See, Gaza, this is where I got Gaza at. Gaza was a problem in Samson's day. Netanyahu is going to solve Gaza's problem. He's going to take care of the thing. We got a sign out there. We got an Israeli flag up on our sign. And I had one guy call me when I was in Florida. Oh, mad, man. He says, you ought to put the Palestinian flag up there, too. I said, no, I'm not because I'm not for the Palestinians. I said, I'm for God, and God is for the Jew. And I'm on the Jew side because God's on their side, and I am not going to go against the Jew for anybody. I said, so you're going to know that right up the front. And I figured if they throw a rock through our sign, we got insurance on our sign. So I get a new sign. I don't even care. I don't even care. Let them do whatever they want. But Samson, he carried the gates away, and he's playing with Delilah and gets all in all kinds of trouble, and he has his eye put out. And God leaves him there grinding in a mill. And, you know, really, if you take the verse that he gave to Peter, what I do, thou knowest not now. He didn't tell Samson what he's going to do. You know, Samson just had to live and go through some stuff and just grind at the mill blind. I don't know what's going on through Samson's head. Nobody knows. Thompson, Thomas, Thomas is walking. He's walked with Jesus for three years. He's watched all the healings, the feeding, feeding 5,000. He's watched the feeding 4,000. He was there when he brought men back. He was there when Lazarus came. He said, let's go with him and die. And he gets there, and, and Jesus brings Lazarus. He watched Lazarus come back out of it. That must have been the weirdest thing to ever watch. It says he was wrapped up like a mummy. And nobody unwrapped him. It looked like he just kind of levitated out of there. And you watch all that stuff, and you see that thing, and the next thing you know, he watched him die on a cross, and he ended up being without faith in Christ. He just didn't believe it no more. And you say, what is it? Well, the Lord never, he told them little by little, but they didn't get it. What I do, thou knowest not now. You will not understand. If you try to, under, I heard somebody the other day, they said, it is impossible for God to split the Red Sea. It was a documentary. The guy's an idiot, a moron. I think it's the widest part of the, the Red Sea where it was, but they think where it went across. He said, it was 30 miles across. And he says, there's no way they could get across that in a day. And if you listen to his reasoning for a few minutes, you would say, well, maybe that's true. And they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, in the, in the valley down there, you stopped the sun from dropping down for the whole day. I said, you could stop everything, man, and you could give them a whole day, two days. You could give them a week to get across that thing. I said, God, who can, you can help them move really quick. You could make the world go faster as they're walking. I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff. You could do whatever you want to do to get them across that thing. I said, here's somebody saying, oh, no, you're trying to put God into your mind and into your little box, and he has to fit in. No, God don't fit into our box. God's in his. He says, as a matter of fact, not even in a box. He don't even know what a box is. Everything to him looks like a pyramid. You, know, you have to get Dr. Roman stuff to get that one. But, but uh, he didn't know. He didn't, he didn't have a clue. Samson didn't have a clue. Uh, Moses didn't have a clue when, when he ended, God just ended the place there with him. Job, Job saw his family grown to adulthood. Then he, 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 was a, he had ability to take care of all kinds of people. He helped them. As you, his friends told him he, he helped the poor. He did everything. He's done all kinds of stuff. 
He was wealthy beyond measure, and then he lost his wealth. He lost his wife or his family. He lost his health. He lost everything. And really, pretty much, God stopped right there with him and just left him there. And you see Job for, for they said all this could have happened in 30 days. You see him go through all this stuff. 30 days of that is, is torment. Then you got Mary Magdalene. Thomas, you had Thomas. He walked with him three years. Thomas, Thomas did his thing, and he ended up losing his faith. Then you got Mary Magdalene standing by the tomb. Uh, she had seven devils in her and whatever. You know what people say? Oh, she was an adulterer. Nah, it doesn't say that. It says she had seven devils. Seven devils will make you do all kinds of crazy things. I'm not saying she wasn't. I'm just saying I don't see it anywhere in the scriptures. But she had seven cast out of her. She loved the Lord for what he'd done for her. She knew that he had done something great for her. She followed Jesus faithfully. She was probably one of the ladies that financially supported him and helped him. Uh, she was at the crucifixion when he died. And she was at the tomb all alone. And the Lord left her there. And you see Mary Magdalene and she's sitting there crying her eyeballs out. Then Stephen. Stephen. How about Stephen? Full of the Holy Ghost. What I do, thou knowest not now. You know, God sometimes does things in our lives that just makes no sense to us. And he lets us be in a spot sometimes where it just makes no sense. And what you have to do is get to a place where you just trust him and nobody else. And Lord, I don't have to see beyond where I'm at. Just help me get through it. That's all you can do sometimes. And you sit there and say, you, you bring that thing down to where the, the hurt and the pain is something that you can drop at his feet and let him have it and let him put that the pieces back together that he needs to put back together Stephen says he's full of holy ghost man he's one of the first deacons deacons if you want to be a deacon you're going to get killed i'll tell you right now so you, you ought to think about being a deacon everybody wants to be a deacon i don't know about deacon one of seven got stoned to death man i don't know if i like that that idea yet he chose to be the first deacon preached the gospel stoned to death by an angry mob isn't that a way for a servant of God to go? You leave it right there. He looked up into heaven, and in heaven he saw the Son of God, Son of Man standing, Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and then they stoned him. Then you got John. Oh, man, our brother John. What a thing. He saw, he saw the same thing Stephen saw. He saw all the deaths, everybody being raised back from the dead, all that. He saw the start of the church. John lived way past all the rest of them. He saw the, the persecution of the church. He saw what was happening to the church. History states that he was boiled in oil to no avail. They couldn't kill him. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, if that was, he, he probably just was sitting there taking a bath, asking for a bar of soap or whatever. Uh, they couldn't burn him. They couldn't do anything to him, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In an attempt to kill him, they tried to kill him. They couldn't, so they, they, they uh, exiled him out to the Isle of Patmos. And you say, what is that? Well, the rest of that verse that Jesus said, but thou shalt know hereafter. You know, out there in a few, you could bet if, if the Lord does something, he's always got a plan at the end of that thing. Moses, I was uh, Elijah. Elijah got to see God's hand in the life of Elisha. Boy, I tell you what, you know, you know what the biggest blessing is you see somebody get saved? When I seen Scott Flood get saved, I mean, that just cheered my soul up. <laughs> I'm still thinking about that thing that, right now. I mean, after, after 30, 32, 33 years, Scott's married, got a bunch of little kids. His kids probably got kids now. And if Scott's still doing the same thing, he was a, a deacon in the church he was in out in, in uh, Chesapeake. If he's still out there doing what he's doing. Uh, Fritz Biederstadt, a uh, brother of mine, he was saved already, but he, I call him up every now and then and talk to him and Cheryl, and, and it's just like I was there yesterday. Just like yesterday. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and, I mean, they're sitting there, Mike, Mike, what's going on, Mike, what's going on? And it's just like yesterday, man. Uh, they love me just like they did, but I don't know why they ever loved me. But they did. Elijah, he, he got to ride out. Oh, man. He, he got to ride out of this world in style. Yeah. Now, you see some black brothers, man. I mean, they, they're good guys. They got the Cadillacs and the big tires and all the different colors and everything else. This was better than that. I mean, this is like a golden chariot coming out with fire coming out the sides and the wheels. And, and not even touching the ground of fire coming off the wheels. The horses flying through the I could be all white stallions, man. Probably had two of the biggest horses you ever had. Best, of, best out of the fleet. And they're coming down, and they pick up Elijah and just take off. I mean, the guy, he would have never saw that. You know what? Elijah, laying under that bush, if he would have got what he wanted, he wanted to die. He said, let me just die. And Lord said, Elijah, you don't see the rest of it. He said, you'll see it hereafter. He said, but it even gets better than that. 
Hereafter, he gets better. He goes, he goes, uh, he got to ride out. He comes back in the time of Jesus on the, on the, Christ is walking the planet. Our Lord and Savior is walking the planet. It says after six days, he goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. There's Elijah and Moses, all dressed in white. Everybody's white. Jesus is all white now, glowing and all over the place. Elijah's glowing. Moses is glowing. They're all sitting up there. Elijah and Moses would have never saw that or even thought about that. But God had a plan. The Lord had a plan, and their plan was those two men. In that position at that time, he has a plan for you. Samson, Samson was able at the last to have victory at the end of his life. He got to go between, uh, the Lord showed him something and said, I've heard, I've heard preachers say he committed suicide. I don't think he had committed suicide. I think he went in battle. The last battle that he went into, he died in his battle. He, all he could do, blind, he would never be able to go out and see without somebody walking him wherever he had to be. The young lad had to put his hands, but he knew exactly which two posts to be under. He said, take me to those two posts, put my hands on those two posts. He knew that his reach on those posts would give him enough strength, and he'd have enough strength. He said, God, he said, Lord, give me the strength. You know, it doesn't say anything about the Spirit of God right there. The first four times that Samson does something, kills the lion, says the Spirit of God came out, and the Spirit of God, this point right here is Samson and the Lord. But it never says anything is now the Lord working through Samson. It says, Samson, and now it's your turn. And he let Samson walk like Samson wanted to walk. And he answered and gave Samson exactly what he wanted. He said, give me strength one last time. And Samson takes his hands, pushes those things, and says he killed more Philistines in Gaza than, than he did his whole life. Job endured everything he had. Job didn't know what was going to happen. And at the end of that thing, you know, it says, but thou shalt know hereafter. He says, what I do thou knowest not now, Peter. But Job, what I do, thou knowest not now. Job, I'm doing some things to you. You don't know what I'm doing. But you will hereafter. If not in this life, in the next one. Job got to see God face to face. Now, I don't know about you, but to even have that possibility or that option, I don't think none of us will ever have that option until we get to glory. But you can see his face in this book. You can read this thing. That's why it, it, it upsets me to no end when somebody starts messing with God's word. This thing has everything in it that you could possibly ever want. You don't need anything else other than what's in these pages. And if you, if you come to this thing with the right heart, you know what most people do? They come with it with the wrong heart. They, they don't have the right heart when it comes to this book. They come to this thing thinking, I can correct it. You cannot correct this thing. If God put this thing together and he directed men all down through history to do what they did, and he directed the men to put this thing together, there's no possible way anybody on this planet could correct this thing. God is finished with it when he got finished with it. So people say, well, what about this? I don't have to. You know what I learned a long time ago? I don't even have to question God no more. I don't have, you know what I know? This thing is so far out ahead of me that I'll never catch up with it. Thomas, Thomas was allowed to see the risen Savior. And that was a short time in his life. What the Lord let me see about those guys getting saved on the ship, he says, Mike, you know you could have went through your whole life and never seen that, and those 15 would have still got saved. He said, but you'd have never seen it. He said, I'm allowing you to see this to show you that what you do is not a waste. It's not vain to ever serve me. It's not vain. Keep doing it. And whether you see something or whether you don't see it, I am not under any obligation to show you anything. He goes, you are under the obligation to serve me. Do you understand that? I said, yes, sir. He said, I told Noah to build an ark one time, and he built it. There's your example. Are you looking at him? Yes, sir. Mary Magdalene, hurt, left. The Lord left her. She watched him die on a cross. It's over. Shortly thereafter, she's the first one to see him come up out of the grave. Now, brother, you're talking about an excited woman. People say people get excited. I bet you that woman got excited. When she turned around and was talking to the guy, and she thought he was just a, a gardener, and he's talking to her like that. And he says, yeah, mm, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, could you, in his mind, he already knows. He says, Mary, if you could just see if you just see past your hurt and your pain, your agony, if you just see past that for just a second, you see something that's greater than all that. <laughs> you'd see me. That's not even being arrogant. That's just facts. I mean, you'd see me. And he takes that away from her, and a few minutes later, she sees him, and, and she, I mean, she's ready to reach out and grab a hold of him, and he says, no, don't touch me. Mary Magdalene was the first to see him. Stephen, Stephen got stoned, and he didn't get to see it. But there's a young man at his feet named Saul. 
that watched him and probably it astonished him when he said, why, why does that young man got what I don't got? I'm doing all this other stuff out here, and, and I, don't, I don't have what that kid's got. That kid's got some. I still think Paul was probably, Saul was probably at the crucifixion, at the, at the place he was at in, under Gamaliel and all the other place, and what he was doing at Stephen's t- uh, stoning. And the sh- it could have only been about 230, 40 days from the crucifixion to then. What, what, what Paul was, I, I wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't in Jerusalem at the time and sitting there watching what went on and even agreeing with Christ being hung on a cross and watching Jesus Christ on a cross, and, and that started changing his life. Lord said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't. There's so many times we don't know what we're doing. And some, you, know, you got a guidebook to help you through this thing, and without this guidebook, you can never know what you're doing. You have to get in this guidebook, and you have to get... You know why people... I have somebody says, you need to go back to Bible college. That's from somebody who's not in Bible college. They've ever been in Bible college. They ain't even got the brains to say... It's a wonder they can even say Bible college. However, comma... You know what I know? There's years. I've still got a lot of stuff to learn. This thing, I'll never be at the place where this thing's at until the Lord takes me home. Then you got John. Stephen, back to Stephen for just a second. He had the privilege of affecting the greatest Christian that ever walked this planet. The moments in his life just before he died and the testimony he gave as Paul was watching that thing, Saul was watching that thing. Stuck with him. When the Lord's over here on the road to Damascus said, it's kind of hard to kick against the pricks, isn't it there, old Paul, buddy? What pricks are you kicking against, Paul? Paul's been kicking. He's been kicking something, man. And the Lord says, it's kind of hard, isn't it, Paul, to kick? You haven't had time to kick. I just knocked you down. You're blind now. There's no kicking there. His kicking was before that. And the Lord starts having a conversation with him. Paul, you kicking. You kicked at Stephen. You kicked at me probably on the cross. You kicked at everything else, Peter and James and John. When James was beheaded, you kicked there. He kicked everywhere. Well, I don't know. Was after, all that stuff was after Paul. That was. But there's some other things that was before that Paul's kicking at. Saul was kicking at. And Stephen, because of what he did, never got to say, see that. But thou shalt see here. Thou shalt see here. You know, Stephen's in heaven. One day Paul pops in. Paul goes, thanks, Stephen. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man, that I, you know, I was, I was really consenting to your death. I didn't, he goes, oh, I know, Paul. He goes, he goes, believe me, there was a day I was messed up too. Not quite as bad as you, but there was a day. And he goes, the Lord came down and got a hold of me, and uh, he changed my life. He gave me the privilege to help change yours. And now you went out and you changed the seventh and 2,000 years later, he, Paul's still changing mine. Well, I tell you what, this is a great book, guys. Amen. Then you got John. Just about done. Give me a couple seconds. John gets thrown at 90, he's 90, somewhere between 90 and 96 years old at this point. And he's out on the Isle of Patmos. And how many years was he thinking, Lord, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? I don't understand. I just don't understand. I don't understand. He says, right, he says, what I do, thou knowest not now. He says, you won't know now, Paul. John, you won't know. You won't know. Years go by and years go by and years go by, and he's sitting on the Isle of of Patmos, and all of a sudden one day the Lord says, John, you've watched the church grow to this point. You've watched my brother Paul do all his stuff. you got all his writings. you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. you got Luke with you. Or I don't know if Luke's with him. I think, I think Luke was around him somewhere. Or they kept in contact, but until Luke died. By 65, 66, they were all dead. John was the only one left. And he has all this. He's already seen the fall of everything and he's, the temple being destroyed and all that stuff. He's watched it all. And he's sitting out there on the Isle of Patmos and Lord says, hey, I want you to pin John. I want you to pin a book about me. And he starts writing. And he writes a book and he finishes John. And he goes, hey, I want you to do first John too. And then second John, then third John. And by the way, would you finish up with Revelation? You know, John got to see some things, and the Lord shows you a life. I'll use John here to finish this up, but he uses John, and he starts him out here somewhere, and him and Peter's out in a, at the bay there, and he looks back and says, the Lord, and, and Peter jumps in the lake and, and, and the river and goes back and gets on the shoreline with the Lord and gets some things right. John's over here leaning on Christ's breast, and why didn't the Lord just take him then? You see, sometimes we'll say, Lord, why, why do you let all that stuff happen in our lives? Because I have something out here that you know nothing about. And I'm not going to tell you about that out there. 
What I want you to do is just get up today and love me and worship me and have fun with me. And let's get through today together. And that's all you're supposed to do. Our Bible is full. It's full of moments in the lives of saints that show pain. We've had four deaths here. Suffering. It shows loneliness. There's going to be days where these four people are going to be missed for some time, probably forever. Uh, there may be days where you stop and think, you know, I think about my dad from time to time. Uh, we never had a really good relationship up to he was 57, uh, 1987. But after that, uh, I told, I told my, my wife, I said, I want my kids to at least know who their grandfather. I never knew who my grandfather was. I never got to meet them. I never, in my mind, I can't picture my grandfather in my mind. I, neither one of them, I, I'd never seen one. I didn't know what a grandfather was. The other day I had a birthday and I'm sitting at a table and the Lord goes, yeah, there's your grandkids and they get to see their grandpa. How about that? I'm like, I don't want to be that old. He says, it's too late. You can't do nothing about that. He goes, and then, you remember your dad? I said, yeah. He said, you took your three kids out there and your dad got to play with your three kids. And they all remember their grandpa. Elizabeth, do you remember my dad? I never got to remember my dad. The Lord says, you miss something, but you didn't let your kids miss it. He goes, you can be selfish. You hear me all the time saying, I want to go home. That's just selfish. I already know it's selfish. I still want to go home, though. My home is beyond the river. It's out of here. It's gone. It's someplace far, far away. <laughs> and I want to go. But the Lord, like Paul said, it's, it's more needful for me to say your why. So my grandkids can see their grandpa. You say, what does that mean? I don't know, but apparently the Lord thinks it's something worth being done. And there's other things that need to be done. There's pain, suffering, loneliness, sickness, death. All through our Bible, you see this stuff. The Lord never shows you that. He's had a blind man. The blind man was blind from his birth. They said, what? And he says to show the glory of God. There was no reason why that blind man, God never gave a reason up to that point why that guy was blind. He had to live his whole life blind until one day the Lord walked in and gave him his sight back. And he said it wasn't because he sinned or his parents sinned. It was for the glory of God. That verse when Peter sat there and said that thing, he says, what I do thou knowest not now. You know what? You got to get to a point in life where you say, okay, Lord, I don't have to understand what you're doing right now. I just know you who you are. That song they sing was great, man, about that. Although it is all, although it is all the Lord's presence, uh, although, and though it is all, I can't even read, man. I don't even know. I'll skip over that part. If the Lord had taken any one of his saints home early, we wouldn't have any of those stories. And you wouldn't have examples to follow. And the Bible would probably be a lot smaller. But he gave you this stuff, so what? You could say, okay, Lord, I've got a death in my family, and I know it's not the end. And I know that they had made a profession, and their profession... They trusted in you, and now they're in your hands. And, Lord, I just have to keep going. And tomorrow will get a little bit better, and tomorrow the next day will get a little bit better. But we'll worry about today, today, and we'll get through today. And then we'll get through tomorrow, tomorrow, and when it comes, sufficient of the day is evil thereof, and I'll, I'll get through tomorrow. And I'll get it. I'll get it. There's a song. As soon as I was doing this thing, I, I started, and this song hit the, my mind. I couldn't get it out of my mind. Uh, the title of the song is Farther Along. It says, Tempted and Tried. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long, while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the Farther along, we'll know more about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it. All by and by, you may not ever understand some things that happen. The Lord said you'll get it later. One of these days, we're going to walk out of this world. We're going to drop this veil of flesh. 
and we're going to step into heaven like Miss Betty did. And when she stepped into that thing, her eyeballs went, and I mean, she probably just about passed out. They probably had to call 911 in heaven (laughs) to come and resuscitate her to get her back up. You say, how do you know that? I know that Paul, when he went to heaven, he said he'd seen things he couldn't speak. Then you got, then you got Boomer Ellison. The last thing he was probably thinking about was driving or racing a car or maybe going to church. I don't know what he was thinking about. But boy, I tell you, the moment he stepped out of that body and stepped into heaven, his eyeballs went poop. And they probably had 911 standing by Betty to come over to get him. Then a few minutes later, in pops, in pops Yvonne. Well, Yvonne was there before Boomer. So they went 911 on Yvonne. Uh, then, then uh, uh, oh, the other one, who was the other? Look, give me, Richard, Richard Donovan. I think it was Yvonne and Richard. And then Miss Betty. And then, then uh, no, actually, I don't know which one got there first or how they got there. But, man, they all got there. And they're all passing out because of what they're seeing in heaven. And this world, it no longer matters to them. And what we have is the Lord saying, you ain't going to get it yet. And guess what, Mike? They had to go through the same thing. I remember Miss Betty always saying, I don't know why I'm still here. I don't know why I'm still here. And she's watched all kinds of things. Could you imagine the things she's watched for 101 years? Changing. Some of y'all may not grasp that. If you're 30, 40, 20 years old, whatever, you don't understand what I'm, maybe you don't understand what I'm saying. A hundred years, the last hundred years, this world has changed like it has not even changed in the last 6,000. This, in the last, it's like this. Not like this anymore. It's like this. It's changed. It is, it's gone. It's weird. It's weird. There's, it just, in my little 66 years, I can't believe what I'm watching right now. However, comma, in heaven, they don't have that problem no more. But we do. And you know what you got to do? Say, okay, Lord, I know they're in a better place, and it's going to be sadness and sorrow. And guess what? Pain's not still going to go away. If it's not this, it's going to be something else. The suffering and the heartache and everything else is going to be there. But we got a Lord that will get you through that thing. And farther along, when you get to heaven, when it's your turn, you're going to understand why. And you'll understand, and you'll see. You ever wondered why they, they're worshiping Jesus for all eternity? Because of, all of a sudden, they understand what he did and why he did what he did and if he hadn't have done that I wouldn't be there and what he's going to give me when I get there far outweighs anything this world could ever offer and I got that for all eternity and I get to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever and honestly I don't know if I'll pay attention to anybody there other than him because he is the only one father thank you for your blessings this morning Lord, we do uh, have sorrow in our church today for losing. There's, there's uh, four families in here, Lord, that have lost people or been around people that has been lost. And, Lord, they're gone. They're with you now. And what a blessing it is each and every one of them had a testimony to be with you. Uh, Lord, now the rest of us, Lord, have to keep going. And, Lord, uh, we may not understand now. And, Lord, we may never understand. And, again, somewhere down the road we may understand. But, Lord, you know everything. And, Father, I just want to thank you that uh, we have someone to trust uh, that can help us in, in times of sorrow, in times of hurt, in times of pain. Lord, that you can walk us through this world, uh, uh, this veil of tears that we're in, uh, knowing that one of these days, uh, Lord, you'll take us away. Lord, bless the families that are affected close to this. Uh, comfort them, Lord, and heal them up. And Lord, uh, all the rest of us, Lord, help us just to be a comfort to them. Father, again, thank you for your blessings, and we'll praise you on you in Jesus' name. Amen.